So, you want to shut down your database, huh? Database shutdown. The question came in about how often should I shut down? Is there an issue with shutting down? When should I shut down? When should I not shut down? So I thought what I'd do is I'd outline my idea, my rules and guidelines for the means and, and frequency that I work to when it comes to shutting down my database down. So my rules and guidelines pretty much fall into two things. Number one is don't. Don't shut down your database. Now, the second rule I have is ever. Don't ever shut down your database. It's as simple as that. I would never ever shut down a database unless I'm actually forced to. And I'm gonna try and justify to you why that that is the case. Shutting down a database I think is a relic of a bygone era when databases had certain issues in terms of when they could be backed up or what kind of maintenance could be occurred. But ultimately, if I can never ever shut down a database, I never ever will. On the Oracle L list recently, someone were doing a poll as to show me your most highest uptime database. And I was thrilled to see that there were some databases in that literally hadn't been bounced for a number of years. And interestingly, some of them are running on Windows as well. So those people that say, oh, you know, Oracle only runs on Linux or whatever, that was proven false. Almost any platform, hopefully you should be able to run your databases and never ever shut them down. Already you can probably get an idea that there's a bit of a warning going on here that I'm going to have a bit of a rant now. Why I think you should never take outages. This is my mantra. Stop taking outages. Not just database bounces, but across the board. I don't think we should be taking outages ever on our databases if we can absolutely avoid it. One of the reasons I say this is for many, many years I've worked for various clients. I often think that outages are the lazy way out or the easy way out. It's amazing how many times when some data maintenance or some structural maintenance has to occur. And yes, it might, before 12.2 in particular, might require more moving parts, more steps to actually enact that maintenance without taking an outage. And so we just go, well, tell you what, we'll wait till you know midnight and we'll have a four hour downtime and, and we'll just deal with that. I think that's a really lazy way of doing it. And, and there's a cost to doing that, which we'll explore shortly. I think really it's not about technical reasons, it's a mindset reason. If your mindset is focused on never ever take an outage unless the software makes me, then I think you're actually doing a better service. Let's talk about the technical reasons first, why I think you should always try to avoid taking an outage. There's an inherent cost to restarting your database. A database is not a laptop. It's not a desktop PC. It's something far more significant and something far more valuable in your organization. You know, we've all seen the, the famous usual clips of, have you tried turning it off and on again? That doesn't really apply or shouldn't apply to the bouncing of databases. Every time you shut down your database, and this is a, a little graphic here to add some humor to the tonight's session, effectively you smoke your database. You smoke all those important things that are running inside your database right now. What is a database? that Oracle has that, that stands it above all the others generally. And it's pretty simple, really. It's all the complexity in terms of managing the data. Let's face it, a text file is a database. The problem is it struggles with concurrency and struggles with format. All the complexity that makes Oracle awesome and also, let's face it, pretty expensive is a key thing. That is why you spend a lot of money on Oracle for all that benefit of, of concurrency and scalability and performance. And all those things are by and large implemented in the memory structures. When you shut your database, what are you doing? You're throwing all those memory structures away. So what you're really doing is throwing away the money that you're spending. It's your investment in that complexity of memory structures that make the database so cool and so awesome. You just throw that away every time you bounce the database. What you have to do when the database comes back again is reinstantiate those memory areas. And that's not cheap. Now, I thought we'd do a little demonstration here to prove that. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna create a table called T. It's got a primary key, single column. It's a very, very simple table. It's organization index, so we can do very, very fast, efficient, primary key probes into this table. The cost of querying it, the actual activity of querying it will be incredibly cheap. There's 10,000 rows in there. This is one of the demos that you can find on every website that talks about using bind variables. We're using bind variables here. I'm doing 10,000 iterations of a very simple select from T 
where X equals the primary key. And you can see that on this machine, I can do 10,000 simple queries in 0.1 of a second. That's very snappy. And then the second part of a typical bind variable demonstration would be, let's look at the worst case scenario. And here I'm repeating the exact same set of queries, 10,000 queries, but you can see on line five, I'm actually concatenating the literal value of I, such that I'm actually gonna present 10,000 individually different queries to the database. That's a parsing overhead. I run that and obviously you can see it's inherently slower. That took 4.1 seconds. Now the reason I'm showing that is when you bounce the database, every query that is presented after that has to be reparsed. It's a hard parse. That's the CPU cost you're paying every time you bounce the database. These are very simple queries and I presented it like this because a common rebuttal nowadays, now that servers are so fast and memory is so fast, is, well, yes, that is slower than your first demo. The first demo was 10,000 queries in 0.1 of a second. This is 10,000 queries in four seconds. But really, that's still 2,500 queries per second. That's not such a big deal, is it? I mean, who cares? That surely is not something that's going to stop me from bouncing my database, or in this case, using bind variables parsing doesn't seem such a big deal. This is true when the queries are trivial. How many of us have trivial queries in our applications? The reality is some of our queries are much more complicated. Let's make it a bit more realistic. Let's say I've just bounced my database and now I'm going to do some queries like this. I've got a two table join here and those two objects in there are actually database views. I've just picked DBA all objects and DBA segments just because I know they're fairly complicated views. These are synonymous with the kind of views and definitions of objects and queries you would probably have in your applications rather than just single row selects. Now I'm using DBMS SQL here because I want to take out the actual cost of running the queries. You can see I'm just doing a parse command on line six there. I'm not even running these queries. I'm simply asking the database to parse it. This is the kind of parsing that would happen for every single query once you bounce your database. Let's give it a go. I'm doing 100 iterations. You can see on line number five, 100 iterations of parsing. I get to take a drink now because I know it's going to take a while. 15 seconds. That's only 100 queries. You can only parse on this machine six queries per second once those queries actually become quite complicated. Parsing is hard work. It's very hard to work out how to run a query in the best way. Sometimes the parsing cost is far more than the actual execution cost. There's a more realistic example of the kind of hurt you're gonna suffer when you actually bounce your database and have to reparse your applications. Now, out of that 15 seconds, let's have a look at how much of it was actually just hardcore CPU times, all of it. So it's not like we were doing IO or we were you know, accessing disk or we were blocked on locks. We absolutely flatlined our machine because parsing is a very, very CPU intensive activity. And believe it or not, that is the best case scenario because I've only got one user here doing this parsing. In reality, when you bounce the database, the moment all your applications fire up again, what happens? We've got dozens or hundreds of sessions all competing, all parsing and all competing for memory structures. It won't be 100% CPU in that case because heaps of them will be blocked and they'll be contending with each other. So you have a lot of expensive CPU and lots of people not getting work done. So the cost of a restart can be huge for complicated applications. But guess what? It can actually be far worse than even that. It can be really not cheap. What do I mean by that? As I mentioned, we have to re-instantiate all these memory areas. Now those memory areas are the buffer cache, they'll be reinstantiated by the cost of IO. Putting stuff into the buffer cache while incurring some CPU cost is probably negligible compared to the disk cost of actually reading it back in. Obviously that would have been avoided if you hadn't restarted, but once you restart, the actual CPU cost is low compared to the disk cost of getting that data back in. So it will be populated as required. The shared pool, as we saw, it's expensive to populate, something to be careful of. The reader log buffer, large pool, other shared memory components, they're generally gonna be reinstantiated on an as required basis. Yes, we've seen there's a big CPU cost, but maybe we're still thinking, you know, that's not so bad. But there's one other area that if you're using it also needs to be repopulated. And that is the in-memory column store. That's totally different. When I populate information into the buffer cache, I'm reading blocks off disk, 
and I'm putting those blocks into pretty much the same structure in memory. It's almost a one for one. Read a block, put it in memory. Read a block, put it in memory. The in memory column store is totally different. As you've seen from probably many presentations on in memory, it is a compressed, rejig, reformatted, transposed, deduplicated representation of the data that was originally in blocks. It's now in a column format. Doing all that work doesn't come for free. In fact, the very first iterations of Oracle 12, when you actually restarted the database, you would often see these W processes, as you can see on screen there, consuming the entire machine. It was working so hard to repopulate the memory store to the extent that we introduced a parameter called in memory max populate servers, which defaults to only half the available CPUs because we recognize the fact that it's expensive to repopulate that in memory store. It costs a lot of CPU and we didn't want to actually destroy your server in doing so. So we kept it at basically only half the available resources. So you've got to work really hard. In fact, if you're on 12.2, you want to be using something called in-memory fast start to avoid this. What that does is at regular intervals, it'll dump the in-memory store down to a blob on disk such that when you do have to restart, which hopefully is as little as possible, we can read that blob structure back into the in-memory area without having to recompress and retranspose all that data from the buffer cache and the database data files. For those, just as a, as a sidebar, you can see that's how you enable it. You do DBMS in memory admin fast start enable. You give it a table space name. And then what happens is you can see we just store a secure file blob, which is literally a binary representation of the in memory store at regular intervals, such that we can read it back in on a restart. But as you can see, if you got in memory, the restart costs are, could be huge for you, as well as all that library cache and share pool and buffer case repopulation. It's a bad idea to restart your databases. What's this picture represent to finish off this question? This is the Centennial light bulb. It's in a fire station somewhere in the US. It's the classic representation of how a database should be treated. This is the longest running light bulb in the world. It's been turned off once since 1905. When they realized that the light was still going, they've now put it on a permanent non-switched circuit. It still burns today. It's the world's longest running light bulb. Keep that picture in mind and that light bulb in mind when you're actually dealing with your databases. If you can, never shut them down. Also, I think not shutting your database down improves your reputation with your employers and your customers. Having said all this, having pontificated now for several minutes about shutdown and restart. One thing that is important is you're going to have to do it anyway at some stage. The reality is in a perfect world, you would never shut down. And that's our aim inside Oracle. We try to get every upgrade to be online nowadays. We try to get all that patching to be online, but we're not there yet. So there's going to be some patching. There's going to be some upgrades that you have to have outages on. It's bad enough that you're limiting your customer's ability to use your applications in that sense because it's forced upon them. My view is you know, have some real pride in what you do as a DBA. Every time you can avoid an outage, you've delivered more benefits for your customer.